Hello, Thought Roomies. Welcome back. For those of you who are new here, I'm your host, Hallie Rose. This is part one of a two-part series with my friend, Eric Morris, who is the CEO of Local 130 Seafood. We recorded this episode back in October and I was feeling weird about releasing any of the content I had recorded before the world started to go through so much radical change before COVID, before the death of George Floyd, before the cascade of events, including the Black Lives Matter protests. And I was feeling worried that it wasn't really relevant anymore. But I sat with it for a while and I have the desire to honor these stories and the incredible knowledge that's here. And what I came to is that my feeling is part of these times we are in are are that these times are ones that call us to educate ourselves about things we weren't really exploring before. And it's time to get interested in everything, to get curious about why we do the things that we do and why we make the choices that we make. That doesn't have to be an overwhelming thing. I truly believe it can be fun. It can be a growing and a learning experience and we can expand in our consciousness together. So after having made that decision, I called Eric up and I said, hey, we're going to release your episode. And he said, uh, a lot has happened in the world and in my business. So I made an exception to my own rule and I actually recorded electronically for the first time on the show with Eric and that will be part two. And my aim was to get current with him and talk about where we are now and how this information stands up in the wake of all this global change. So here in part one, you're going to learn so much about seafood. Sadly, we are currently in the United States importing over 90% of our seafood. So Eric and I really dive deep into what the environmental and economic repercussions of this are. If you're listening to this intro and you're going, oh, what seafood? I don't really care about that. Let me tell you now that the things you will learn, such as about the adulteration of seafood like scallops about how our prized ahi tuna is being injected with CO2 to give it that pretty reddish pink color. The things you will learn in this podcast about the fishing industry will astonish you and probably educate you to be able to make more informed decisions about your diet moving forward. And by the end of this, you're probably only ever going to want to get your fish locally. And um, if you're anything like me, after listening to all this information, I asked Eric about, could I buy my fish from him? And Eric's rule is um, for sustainable seafood is just eat domestic, eat sustainable. And his company, Local 130 Seafood is named for the 130 miles of New New Jersey coastline. And his company really aims to inspire people to support local fisheries and eat local seafood whenever and wherever possible. So Eric, because of all of the events and COVID, he actually has had to pivot more of his business online, which is kind of a cool... um, I guess, repercussion of all of this. And so he's now offering his fish nationwide, which wasn't happening before. So if you want to do like a sushi night or a date night, you can get a box of Eric's fresh seafood, especially after you hear about scallops, you're not going to want to buy those in the grocery store anymore. And I personally got to try a lot of Eric's food. He brought some for me when we did this first interview and he made me some sushi from his fish. And honestly, it was like velvet just biting into this. It was like melt in your mouth fish. There's nothing like eating fresh seafood that's never been frozen. And this is amazing. And, and now Eric has the ability to actually ship you fish anywhere in the United States. It's all done with um, gel packs and it's kept really cold like it's in a fridge or a freezer. Um, So that's amazing. And just for Thought Room listeners, Eric's offering a discount of $15 off your entire order. 
Um, so that's for a, a minimum of $75 order. You can get $15 off on his website, which is local130seafood.com. And you just use the code thoughtroom at checkout to access that deal. So check out Eric's website, super cool stuff on there. There's also, when I was poking around, there's a little option. You can donate $4 uh, for a free meal, for a meal to support a meal. Eric gives away a lot of meals. He does a lot of work in his community and churches, community organizations and with food banks. And he brings this beautiful fish into the community and often gives it away. So you can help support that work too on his website. Again, the website is uh, local130seafood.com and the code is thoughtroom for $15 off. And lastly, on a personal note, I have now officially started my newsletter. So if you're not on that train, you're going to want to get on it right away. You're going to get the um, weekly podcast announcements. You're going to get excerpts from my book and all sorts of other cool things. You're going to get updates about the courses I'm developing I'm developing right now a course on conscious masculinity and I'm going to take a small group of men and we're going to dive into nonviolent communication. We're going to dive into Tantra. We're going to dive into how to communicate with women in uh, ways that will be well received. What are the blind spots around uh, masculinity that we can unpack together? And I really believe that bringing in a course built from a woman's perspective is, is going to be super helpful. Um, so if you want to find out about that course, you can sign up to hear when it launches at hallyrose.com slash men. So that's H-A-L-L-I-E-R-O-S-E.com slash men. And to sign up for the newsletter, just visit thoughtroompodcast.com. Without further ado, here's my friend, Eric Morris. Morris, welcome to the Thought Room. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you and I know each other through Aubrey Marcus and the Fit for Service program. And last week we were in Sedona, which was pretty wild. And we were staying at this Airbnb, this big, beautiful house with mountain views and you cooked up this incredible, incredible meal for a group of like 15 of us. And we were sitting at that table. It was like this, it was like Knights of the Round Table. It wasn't Glass round, but it was like this 15 people. epically long yeah. dinner table. And we had candles and we were just all feasting on the peppers and oh man, you 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 were. It was, I was just going out to buy a couple of things yeah. and ended up cooking an extravagant meal. But that stuff's easy. That's what I do. That's what I enjoy. Yeah, it's how I show love. I put love into my food and then into your face. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny because someone actually took a picture of the food that you had made and then quoted you and was like, "I'm just going to run out for a couple steaks." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that was this the is plan. what tur- it turned into. Yeah, I've always really loved to cook. It's how I found seafood. It's how I found kind of my passion. I was cooking. Um, I, I was like the, the lonely, like white prep cook in like a kitchen that was with a bunch of awesome Spanish dudes and just really enjoyed my time and had such a great experience. And uh, I just talked back to everybody, mm-hmm. to like all the upper management and could never really get any further. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go sell seafood. Mm. See how that works. And here I am today. Yeah. Yeah. So you, I was asking you before we started recording, what do you consider yourself? And you're like, I'm a fishmonger. I'm a fishmonger. <laughs> and I was like, it's yeah, great to but be you're a monger. So, yeah, I was like, but you're so much more than that. And you were like, yeah, it's great to be a monger. You should be able to call yourself a monger these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So true. Because there's not many of them, right? You're a cheesemonger, but that's really mm. it. Fishmonger. It's, wow. Yeah, it's fun. Seafood has uh, become my life, become my passion, become my art, become my hobby. It's uh, 
second nature to me. Yeah. I, don't, I like the stories behind how people caught the the fish in our ocean. It's our last wild caught protein source. Like we're not out mm. there catching beef. We're not hunting down chickens. We're not searching for, you know, vegetables. We're growing and we're farming, but we're not with seafood. It's it's the last wild caught protein source. And so there's stories that go along with it that I don't think should die or become big factory farmed ingredients, which is kind of the direction that they're going. And uh, we have kind of an alarming situation that's happening in the United States is that we're importing 90% of the fish that we consume. And that's like, and, and we're just kind of letting uh, our coastal communities go to to waste while we're not supporting them because we're, you know, listening to big business and we're listening to major marketing campaigns and we're listening to people to tell us where to to eat our fish. And I just, yeah, I, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's it's the direction that we should be going in. Yeah. And I mean, again, going back to the dinner that, that you created for us, I think everybody around that table was awestruck with the stories that you were telling. We all kind of just sat down playfully to eat. And then you were sharing what felt like a walking encyclopedia of, of information about what's happening with, um, the fishing industry, sustainability, the oceans. And I just was like, I need, I need you to sit down with me yeah. and, and be on this podcast. So thank you so much again for, for being here. Um, I would like to start with asking you about food in your life in general and w- what it was like growing up. Like, where did this passion for food come from? Cause I've seen the way you put it together. And when you say you cook with love, I see it and you arrange sure. it and you, you spice it in these ways. Yeah. Well, I was a fat kid. <laughs> and so I ate a lot of fast food and, uh, growing up it was, I never knew how to cook until college. And then, uh, I burned a lot of things and I was really bad at it, but I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And I found that it was something that I like to do and it became a hobby. And then it became a passion of like going to farmer's markets and just shopping with local ingredients and, and really trying to create an experience around food. Um, and then I work, I, I've always worked in restaurants. I always found myself gravitating to work in restaurants and, uh, you know, cooked at the restaurants, did everything in a restaurant, every position known to man and just, and, and loved it. And, uh, I loved protein. And when I was cooking, I, uh, really liked calling my fish order and I liked working with seafood. And so I ended up getting a seafood job in New York city. Um, a seafood job. What does that mean? <laughs> I didn't get the job of my dreams. So I had a... And what was that? I was I was going to be a... I was going to be a uh, front of house manager for the Hillstone Group. And so they fly you out to Napa and you do this like wine immersion program. And it was... I was just going to be this like general manager of a major corporate restaurant and you know, wearing suits every day. And I was going to be a Somalia and just love my life. And yeah, that didn't work out. What's the story behind that? (laughs) I I prepped for this interview. Like it was the last interview I was ever going to give. Mm -hmm. And I was going to nail this job. And on my way, on my way to the interview, I was on the seven train crossing town and somebody had a heart attack on the train and they pulled the emergency stop which is never a good thing to do in an emergency situation, like get to the next stop and get help Um, in between, in between platforms. We, uh, so we had to wait 40 minutes for, to get them through. Um, I got out and it was just mass chaos traffic. And so I ran about six avenues in 10 blocks to get to this interview, showed up 10 minutes late. The guy who was sweating, I'm sure, <laughs> pouring. Literally, it was 100 degrees. And the first thing that Keith Clancy, the, the HR guy, <laughs> I remember his name, said to me is, Mr. Morris, you're perspiring quite <laughs> profusely. Why don't you go clean yourself up? And uh, I proceeded to go to the bathroom, bury my head in cold water, and then enjoyed 30 minutes of the worst interview of my life. Mm. Next day, I took a, a, a job in Long Island City working for a company called Wild Edibles. And it was a a middle of the road fish company that we were trying to be kind of upper, upper tier and as far as seafood. And so I started selling seafood to restaurants in New York and uh, just kind of hustling, you know, going in and out of Manhattan and, you know, bringing fish on the subway when I needed to, and and just uh, 
really uh, selling seafood to chefs. You know, my territory was Manhattan and I would focus on higher end, sophisticated chefs that were, you know, going for awards, James Beard's awards that really enjoyed protein. And I found that where the job was good, I spent more time explaining how things got messed up than actually explaining fish. Mm. And so I got super frustrated. And every time I would ask a question like, oh, who caught this? Where was it from? And it was like, I don't know, Joey, Tommy, or Vinny up in the Bronx. We got it from the Bronx. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not really right. Like mm. there's a story behind, mm. you know, this piece of black sea bass that like, I want to know, like, mm. where did it come from? And so I, uh, I joined forces with a friend of mine up in Boston and uh, moved to Boston and started uh, working with a company on the Boston Fish Pier for five years. And we really advocated for the American fishermen. And uh, I kind of got a PhD in seafood, you know, whether it was like going down to small Cape Cod docks like Hyannis or Chatham and like jumping in in a squid hold and like being up to my chest in squid and unloading it in the middle of the night and racing it back up to Boston to get processed. Um, to unloading bluefin tuna by hand and like, uh, you know, driving a truck down to these beautiful port cities where local fishermen would unload their catch directly into the back of my truck. And then we would take it to market, but we would take it to wholesale market to uh, not to restaurants. So we would sell it around the country. And, uh, you know, we scaled that business really fast. We did about maybe 30 million when I left after five years, we kind of started in some like Southie, uh, South Boston apartment. And uh, yeah, it scaled it scaled quick and it was a lot of fun, but the direction that my business partner was going was uh, through Cisco and through big corporate kind of conglomerates. And I, I just, I saw a vision a little bit different. And so I took kind of what I learned in the model and, and brought it down to New Jersey, which is where I am now. So I'm really interested in what that vision is and why it feels so important for you. Cause, cause when you talk about it, I can hear how emphatic you are about these, the stories of where the fish came from and like, why should people care about this stuff? Cause I, I, I do, but I know that a lot of people, it's just not something that it's at the forefront of our minds. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of bad policies. There's a lot of bad seafood stories, right? Like tilapia, mm-hmm. like tilapia sucks. It's really good for business because you can put a ton of them into a garbage can and grow them because they're they can they're they're good with pen density, so they can survive with two hundred other tilapia neck and neck eating each other's feces like mm. doesn't matter, and so you can grow them anywhere, any place. It's easy. It's and uh, you know that's just a fishery that like why are we supporting because big business is telling us to, mm-hmm. like yet we're paying you know, 25 cents for a porgy that's coming off of a local dock in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, or Montauk, New Jersey, or Montauk, New York. And it's going into a freezer and being used as bait. Like, Mm. I just see something wrong there, Mm. right? And we're we're buying this stuff from like Thailand and Bangladesh and areas that like our carbon footprint just to get the fish here is is not sustainable, let alone like how it's being sourced. Right, so so what do you... What do you attribute that to? Is it just marketing? It's, yeah, it's big business. Because I, because I know even you mentioned tilapia is like that's one of the fish that's so, so like, lean and good for you to eat, right? Same with Bronzino, mm. right? New York and Bronzino. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows Bronzino because right. they had a hundred million dollar marketing campaign mm. with an easy to farm fish and created the next best piece of seafood in the world. Mm. And now there's you know Turkish conglomerate businesses that are um, telling us what to eat when. We're ignoring, you know, fishermen on the coast that are, you know, we're going to, they're going to go extinct. Mm -hmm. Like we're not going to have a fishing community Mm -hmm. if we kind of keep not supporting them, you know, and not paying a fair wage. Mm -hmm. Right. So like they, they are, uh, they are paid based on what they're catching. And if we're not supporting what they're catching, we're not supporting them as business owners. This is really fascinating because it brings me back to one of the things that you were mentioning at dinner, which is you know, eating what is being caught. Eating from the ecosystem. Right. And you were Mm -hmm. talking about these other communities around the world that are um, kind of cultivating certain types of seafood that, I mean, you do a better job at explaining it, but basically in the future, these people are going to have 
like a, a very sustainable source, but we might not think it's trendy. So- right, right. Well, so yeah, what, what we don't, res- I, I hate to use the word respect, but we don't, we're not eating what's coming out of our ecosystem. So mm-hmm. in, New, in New Jersey, in New York, in Maryland, we have dogfish, porgy, skate wings, um, mung tails. These are all amazing fish that are really abundant that have high stock quotas. And we're not eating them. We're shipping them abroad. Mm-hmm. So we're sending our dogfish to Europe for fish and chips. We're sending our skate wings to France. We're sending our um, monkfish to Korea. So all these other countries are enjoying our delicacies that are our local ingredients. But because they're not like sexy, quote unquote, we, um, we're, we're shipping them out of the country. When these are the things that we really should be supporting, these are the things that we should be eating because they're the next generation of species. Mm-hmm. We're not going to have the striped basses, the cods, the swordfish, the tuna, if we keep eating them and keep overfishing them. Um, that's not to say that they're overfished now, but, um, you know, it's, it's, we, we need to eat what's abundant, mm. right? Like if, if you're out in a field and you're growing, uh, arugula and you have a really great arugula catch, you're going to eat the arugula, right? You're not going to ship it here, ship it there. No, you're going to eat it. Mm. So like, why are we not eating what's coming out of the water and what's plentiful? And that's really what I base my business model on mm. is eating with this, with seasonality and eating with what's coming out of the, the water, mm. You know, eating what's being caught. And, you know, fishermen in the United States do a good job of catching what's allowable, right? And so we do a really good job at managing our fisheries and our fishery policies are some of the mo- the strictest in the world. And that to me means that they're sustainable, right? And since 1976, we passed the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which really set quotas and limits on what we're allowed to catch. Because before then it was it was like the heyday of fishing. Like, hey man, we caught forty thousand haddock, and we're bringing them to market, and we're going to crack champagne, and like, let's go. And so they invented technology, and then they started wiping out fish stocks because there was sonar and radar. They can track them, and now we can get all of the fish. And so that wasn't sustainable, especially in you know areas like Massachusetts, which was the cod capital of the world. Well, they overfished the cod population. So now they're rebuilding that and it's been a struggle, um, you know, so, so eating with what's allowable, eating what's being caught is, is sustainable. And so if we abide by U.S. regulations and we um, are, are eating seasonally, we're eating sustainable. That doesn't really matter what we're catching, right? These guys or the government is spending millions and hundreds of millions of dollars on science every year and to track these species so that our grandchildren's grandchildren are eating the same species, right? And so that nothing's going extinct. So if we're eating with these guidelines in place and we're harvesting with these guidelines in place, then we have a sustainable fishery, hopefully for generations. Mm. That's the plan, mm. right? So I'm sticking to the plan. Mm. I'm just a fishmonger. All I can do is mm. is eat what I'm told to. we're allowed to catch, Yeah, you know, and sell what we're allowed to catch. And yeah, that's it. But we're doing a good job of rebuilding certain stocks. And it's been, uh, you know, fun yet stressful. I'm just thinking about people who are listening to this, who are having a moment of, oh, okay, interesting. I could probably bring a little more awareness to where I'm sourcing my fish from. I'm just buying it at my local supermarket. And all of this information sounds really important. What would be a first step? For someone like that, I'm assuming to find um, a local source, obviously, and get to know where, who and where their fish is coming from. You know, I think a lot of the big organic grocers are doing a good job labeling where the stuff is coming from. But let's also think about what is a grocery store's number one objective to hold, right? We got to hold and maximize shelf life. Mm. And usually we're going to do that through preservatives. So a lot of the stuff that you're buying in certain grocery has been soaked or adulterated with chemicals and um, different preservatives, which uh, provides, you know, maximum amount of shelf life, you know. You were talking about scallops. So yeah, the scallop industry is gross. So we harvest scallops and they, scallops are all water. And so they come out of the water. Like a really high percentage. You they come out like- of the water at 77% mm. moisture. Mm. And legally to be considered, a, a, a there's a term wet and dry scallops. So a wet scallop is anything that's 83 and above. 
that means it's been soaked, it's been processed. Anything 83 and below is, is technically dry, but a true scallop comes out of the water at 77%. So now you have 66% to play with. Mm. Now think about if you're processing 600 to, to a million pounds of scallops. You made 6% on that mm. just by putting them in, in, in a saltwater bath. So, so basically, legally, they have to take a certain ma- amount of the ocean water out? Is that? No, no. Like, they're moisture, and scallops absorb oh. moisture. Mm. So, like, so they add, they, they take in water, mm-hmm. right? So they're at 70 cents. They'll take in an extra 6%, six mm. percent of their weight in preservatives. Wow. So they'll soak it right up. Wow. And but it'll still be considered So a, it's a chemical sponge. It's essentially a chemical sponge, yes. And we're eating it. And you're eating it, yeah. I mean it's tripolyphosphate. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So you brought me some scallops today those, and those are fresh off the boat, right? Yeah, yeah. So you that's one thing you said that you never buy. I'll never buy them. Mm-hmm. I'll never buy adulterated scallops. I'll never do any adulterated um, scallops. Yeah, I won't do any processing, you know, adding extra shelf life. Wow. I never have, I never will. It's, I just don't, I don't believe in the process. It's, it's yeah. lacking integrity mm. for, for the item. Right. So beyond scallops, can you talk about what else you personally would never buy in a grocery store? Like if you were in a bind and you had to, you know, get some fish that wasn't from you, would you? Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of items that I wouldn't buy. Mm-hmm. I would never buy Chilean sea bass. Why? Just because the eco footprint. Okay. Right, it, it's not a great fish. Mm-hmm. It was abundant in the the '90s, and so we came up with some certifications that said it was super abundant. Now they're having some issues with it. We're flying it from Chile. Mm-hmm. Like, I would, I just, I don't, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in Bronzino. I don't believe in pasteurized crab meat out of China. I don't believe in uh, imported catfish. I don't believe in a lot of imported shrimp. You know, shrimp. For me, I'm super uh, sensitive to phosphates. And so shrimp is soaked in, in uh, phosphates and, and sulfur. And so when I eat imported shrimp that has been soaked, I get red and my ears swell for some reason. Wow. And so like, I don't like feeling like that after I eat a piece of food. Um, so I'd stay away from things like that. I think, uh, you know, as far as salmon, I'm not a big Chilean salmon guy. I think that the Norwegians and the guys in the Faroe Islands, they do a really good job. They're not organic, but they're making every step they can to be organic in their processes. So I think that, uh, you know, avoiding things like that and and trying to eat what's seasonal. And so like Whole Foods is, um, you know, I think needs some help in, in sourcing domestic. I think they do a good job of, of sourcing internationally. But like if I go to a grocery store and I'm 50 to 100 miles from an ocean, like I'd like to see something that's coming out of that ocean, mm. right? Not mm. something from Iceland or, or or Chile or Norway or other areas of the world. We need to start supporting things. So first I'd, and foremost, I would I would eat something that's locally sourced, mm-hmm. locally caught. Um, if there's a story behind it, even better. You know, I do, you know, Whole Foods does have some good stories. They mm-hmm. do. Um, and so, yeah, you can also buy Seafood Direct from a lot of really awesome sources. So, and we're, we're working on an online platform to do that soon. That'll, that'll be up and running. Oh, great. Yeah. So that's interesting. You were saying Whole Foods has a lot of stories. So people, I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, even people in my family or um, my friend circles who like, this is completely out of their realm. You and Mm. I, we operate in this little bit of a bubble where these are the conversations that we're Mm. having a lot of the time. But if I were to go try and give someone a advice about how to eat local fish. Um, first I probably send them to you. (laughs) And then I, you know, I'm just wondering, like people could go into like whole foods and be like, Hey, where's the local fish at? Yo, you know, and like ask a manager or go to a farmer's market, obviously if there's fish there. Or find like small producers, small fish markets, small Mm. businesses, Mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of the a lot of the small businesses are supporting local because that's mm. what they do. That's what they know. Mm. So like in every major city across the country, there's a really good fish market. Mm-hmm. We were just in Phoenix. I stopped at a fish market called Nelson's Fish and Meat, and I was shocked at how amazing mm. the product was in Phoenix, Arizona. They're in a desert. Mm-hmm. And they had like 
<laughs> day boat everything and really sustainable products. And it was just, it, it was really, really incredible wow. to see. And I know that there's small fish markets like that. I have one in Asbury Park, New Jersey. I know there's some in Chicago and Philadelphia. And so like, you know, we've gotten away from putting in a little extra step in our eating habits, right? Mm-hmm. We just want to go to the grocery store. It's a one-stop shop. And then we go home and then we cook, you know, product. But like, the truth is when you're cooking really good fish, your house isn't going to smell like fish, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But when you're cooking old preserved product, like it's, you're going to, it's going to get fishy. I can taste so palpably the difference in your fish than other fish that I have. Like I basically told you, you've like ruined me and now <laughs> I need to get my fish from you. Luckily you're in New Jersey. So that's yeah. close by, but it's, I mean, and, and the first time I had your food, I think was at Larry's and you, you brought scallops and you talked about how you like to eat them raw, but only, you can only do that, you know, if they're right yeah. off the boat. Um, I'd never eaten scallops like that before. It was, it was amazing. And you're from Canada. You're from scallop country. I know, man. I don't know. <laughs> I've been limited, I guess. But also um, I was thinking of tuna because in uh, Sedona at the brunch, so you f- actually flew out. Yeah, I flew out uh, maybe like 60 pounds of, of different seafood. I, I brought out uh, bluefin tuna. I brought out uh, some lobster meat and made a nice lobster salad. And then I shucked like 100, 150 oysters, yeah. um, made some tuna poke. And then I brought out uh, a piece of tuna belly. That was you pretty literally sweet. like So ha- they just stored it in the plane underneath? And yeah, it yeah. Like- I sent it cargo and gel packs. Yeah. You know, fish ships really well. As long as you know how to do it, you can hold the temperature in a styrofoam like at 38, 37 degrees. So it's like putting it in your fridge. Mm. Right. And so I did that. I put it uh, in the cargo, flew it out and then cooked it up for y'all. It was good. Yeah, it was so good. And the the tuna, the ahi, was it like an ahi tuna? It's bluefin. Blue. So ahi just means tuna in Hawaiian. Uh, so like just calling it tuna. Tuna, tuna. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about tuna. Tuna is a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting species, and especially the bluefin tuna. As As Americans, we have essentially been uh, said that the bluefin tuna is extinct and you shouldn't eat it. And if you're eating it, you're damaging the ecosystem. And how dare you eat a bluefin tuna? They're the apex predator of the ocean and there's none around. And the truth is, is that in the, in the West Coast, they're, they're an endangered species. I wouldn't call them an endangered species, actually. They're hard to come by. Mm-hmm. Um, the Japanese have developed... Uh, some some fishing techniques that uh, wipe out really large pods really easily. And so, which is called persaning. So a persane is one giant boat that then has a skiff that then circles an entire pod of fish and can catch 100 pieces at a time. And these aren't small animals. They're 200 to 1,000 pound animals. So these are like massive, massive, massive fish. But in the East Coast, in the Northeast in particular, we have small quotas and we're only allowed to artisanally catch them. So that means that we're only allowed to catch them with a rod and reel or we're only allowed to catch them on a long line, which is limited, but the other way of catching is an electric harpoon. Hmm. So like we're literally out there harpooning fish. And what's happened is, is that the stocks have rebuilt so much. And five years ago, six, seven years ago in that realm, we came out with a TV show called Wicked Tuna. And it was a really popular TV show. And everybody saw these guys catching these giant fish and then sending them to Japan. And they were getting paid $30 a pound. And so it created this fishery where everybody that watched the TV show then went out, got a permit, and started catching bluefin tuna, which really sucks for the guys that were catching bluefin tuna beforehand and were making a good livelihood. We went from 800 permit holders to 8,000 permit holders. And now we're, we have uh, increased quotas every year because the fish is coming back because we're artisanally catching it. Mm-hmm. We're not going out and catching 100 pieces at a time. We're catching one per day per boat. And so, but now we have 8,000 boats. Um, and so huh. today actually marks the opening of the bluefin tuna season and we've already caught 24 fish today. Wow. So there's 24 fish that are coming 
down to us or we'll export some and, and we'll send, but there's a massive, massive fish population. But a lot of the guys that are catching these fish don't know how to handle them. So we're dealing with uh, a lot of a lot of different problems and fish like anything else have issues. Mm. So like, just because you caught a fish doesn't mean it's gonna be nice. Okay, t- talk about yeah, that. Like what so, do you mean don't know how to handle them? Like they're getting right. damaged? So, well, tuna is different because tuna is a warm-blooded species. And tuna, if you fight it too hard, it'll it'll fight super hard. And they're big balls of muscle. They're giant balls of muscle. They're all meat. They're muscle. They're thrashing around. And well, so they work so hard. And since they're warm blooded, they'll essentially fight so hard to live that they will cook themselves. So they will legitimately cook themselves from the spinal bone out into the meat. Oh my god! And so, uh, you know, if a fisherman doesn't know what he's doing or doesn't know how to handle the fish, he'll he'll catch an animal that's worthless, right? Wow. And that animal could have been worth $10,000. Could have wow. been worth $20,000. But because he didn't know what he was doing, he made it worthless. Another way that, you know, a fisherman can kind of mess up is if he doesn't handle the fish right um, and guts the fish wrong. Mm. So there's really kind of scientific ways to gut a fish so that you pres- preserve the integrity of the meat. Now, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to gut it from the butt to the to the head and that's the wrong way to do it. It'll oh. it'll essentially soak the fish with water and that fish will be worthless. So what we're seeing is a ton of really poor quality fish out there and a massive amount and they're big animals. And so to handle a 500 pound animal is really tricky. And so there, it's, there's no real big market for it yet they're catching them. So now we're like, oh my God, I have this amazing quality piece of, of sushi grade sushi that I, tuna that I can't sell anywhere because it's 500 pounds and there's 25 of them and I don't know what to do. And so that's why I have no hair <laughs> currently because I, I uh, it's it's a struggle and and we've we've really put such a negative connotation around the, the fish because of what's happening on the west coast and what's uh, and we're just kind of ignoring this like beautiful fishery from really North Carolina, to, to, you know, the tip of PEI Canada. And um, it's it's kind of sad to see, and we need to bring kind of light to that fishery because we're allowed to catch these fish. These fish are abundant. If we want to continue eating, you know, tuna, we should be eating the tuna that's coming out of our local waters. Mm. We should be eating artisanally caught tuna, you know, not importing it from Fiji or areas where the stocks are, are low and the, uh, you know, the Maldives or Brazil or, or areas where like they're not regulating their fishery. In the United States, if you harvest a bluefin tuna without a permit, like you go to prison, like you go to jail. Um, I don't think they're taking it that seriously in, in a lot of other countries. I, I, I know they're not taking it that seriously in a lot of other countries. Um, and so, you know, we need to, we need to fight for a better price and, and fight for more people using U.S. and Canadian tuna, really. Mm-hmm. It's pretty It's pretty crazy. It's, but it's, at the same time, I mean, I love the fish. It is just beautiful. You have a piece of it in your freezer or your fridge now. It's like chop it up, eat it raw. It's delicious. It's mm-hmm. what I served, um, you know, to, uh, to you guys in Arizona. You mm-hmm. know, but a lot of people are very against it. And I understand their concerns, but I don't think that the science is, is caught up to date. I think that the science 10 to 15 years ago was accurate and that we didn't have we didn't have evidence that this stock was really rebuilt. We got the evidence now, but it's slow. Mm. And so unless somebody starts marketing the fact that the science is saying that we have these stocks available and that we're we should be harvesting this product, like we're still going to have that negative like impact. You know, really like guys like Dan Barber who are really awesome food advocates, you know, he really goes into the bluefin tuna fishery and advocates against it and I just I disagree as a fishmonger and as somebody that sells the fish who has one tattooed on his forearm. Mm. Um, I I believe in the fishery. I believe in the nature of the fishery, but the fishery is, uh, is in danger if we don't support it, you know? Mm. Are you seeing that? I mean, you've been in this for how long you've been doing this? Uh, 12 years. 12 years. Do you see that often, not just with the tuna, but with other things where it seems like the legislation it, there's a discrepancy between the laws and like what's actually 
catching how we're catching up it, yeah it's slow to adapt i mean so, bureaucracy right yeah. like it's you're not gonna get anything super fast mm-hmm. you know they're trying and they're making laws that uh you they think are right on the, at the time but when you ask the people that are really out there doing the work it's not accurate mm-hmm. you know um in new jersey they've cut our flu quotas 20 percent the last couple of years and that's a major major fishery for for new jersey and and when fishermen are talking like they're there the fish are there. We can harvest them. Their uh, stocks are there well. Mm. You know, and hopefully it will, you know. In a lot of these states, like, seafood is like the redheaded stepchild. It's, mm. it's you know, <laughs> I say, you know, in New Jersey, we have a fishery that's the most underrated $2 billion fishery in the mm. state. Like, we should be supporting something that's really bringing um, a positive economic impact to, like, major economies on, on scale. Like, we're talking about, you know, Fishermen are going to go out and they're going to spend money on bait, oil. They're going to spend money on gear. They're going to spend money on at their bars, their restaurants. Like we're having like you can trace the the money through the supply chain. And I think that's important, especially to support coastal communities. And it's not just in New Jersey. It's throughout the United States. And frankly, in a lot of in a lot of, you know, good fisheries abroad. You know, I think Costa Rica is an example of certain fisheries that do a really good job. I think there's there's some in the Caribbean and. These are small producers. They're not like big corporate factory fishers. Mm -hmm. I love listening to you talk about this because. At least somebody does, right? (laughs) Again, the passion is so palpable. And this is where I'm going to get a little bit woo woo because it's like, I I, I guess, like, I want to know what drives you in your core about this mission. And I was thinking about, someone was telling me today about the karma, the karma of fishing. And I was like, ooh, this is really intriguing. And someone told me a story about a monk in a Hare Krishna village in Australia telling this story or this anecdote about fisheries in, um, Southeast Asia and how they were just like obliterating the ocean, taking all of this stuff out years and years and years. And then the tsunami happened and it was like, okay, people were taking from the ocean, taking, 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 taking from the ocean. And then here you have the tsunami that says, okay, now ocean's going to take from the land. And Mm -hmm. there's like this balancing effect. So I'm curious about how that plays into to what you're doing. And, and I know you've told a couple of stories about the, like the karmic uh, part of fishing and, and throwing things back or keeping them and what is the best way to honor. So I'd love to hear you speak on that. Yeah, minute. again, it's it's supporting what's allowable and doing it in an artisanal way and not overtaking, right? Like if if you're hungry and you go to a an apple tree in season, you're not gonna eat all of the apples that are coming out of, off the tree. You're gonna eat one. Mm-hmm. Right, like eat what's coming out of the ocean seasonally. Um, you know, my job is to protect the ocean. It's where I live. It's what I do. Like, I want my grandchildren's 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 to eat steamers and and clams and oysters, just like I'm gonna do. You know, at a, a seasonal restaurant. Like, I want them to have that same love for for awesome locally sourced product. And so, I think that to support that and karmically. You have to just do what's what's right by the ocean. And so, you know, I think that our policies are good. I think there's some some areas that we need to that we need to look at and some areas that we need some improvement on. But if we're uh if we're harvesting what's seasonal, it's it's very like getting back to nature, right? It's getting back to like our ancestors. It's mm-hmm. getting back to like going out in a skiff and harpooning a fish and bring it home and feeding communities. Like, and that's what, um, you know, that's what I strive to do. And, you know, which brought me to uh, actually uh, a USDA grant. So I was awarded a food system grant to uh, bring seafood to urban communities and to help food deserts. And so we, um, we bring porgies and whiting and, and monk tails to areas like Trenton and Newark and uh, underprivileged areas and, and low income areas. And really, kind of sell at cost to to get really awesome product to the masses that normally couldn't really afford it or don't have access to it, you know. And, and what's awesome about that is that those are the communities that really support it, 
right? You have like low income Caribbean communities, for example, that love fish. You know, I live in one, I live in a Haitian community that loves fish and snapper. Mm -hmm. And like, they're the people that are really supporting these fisheries. And when you look at like the upper income and the upper social class, these are the people that want the fanciest thing from around the world. Mm -hmm. And they're not supporting the fishery, but, Mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, so we seek to kind of change that and to support, um, you know, lo- lower incomes by helping with this grant. It's been really good. Mm-hmm. It's been a good program. We're in 14 farmers markets around the state and in Philadelphia and looking to grow that that program with obviously government assistance. Amazing. Wow. What a, what a fantastic project. Um, I'm sitting here thinking about, okay, so theoretically, let's say I'm someone in the upper echelon going, shit. I like to eat a lot of fancy fish. This is not something I was aware of. I am open to hearing more about the ways in which I'm being marketed to, but including- let's, let's, not, let's not confuse, like we have some really fancy fish in New right. Jersey, in New York, in Maryland, in right. Florida. So we can eat, we can do that domestically. We can do right. that by not, you know, having huge carbon footprints to get right. fish here. Totally. And I'm saying, I, I know there's going to be people that are listening to this who are like, okay, I, w- I want to change my ways. And there were things that you mentioned at dinner the other night that I was not even aware of what was happening as far as the same fish being marketed under a different Seafood fancier fraud. name. It's, it's an you, epidemic. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, it's also marketing too. And it, it happens at the wholesale. It happens at the chef level. It happens um, to get people to eat product, right? That's what people want to do. And so some people, you know, will label Pollock as blue cod, or they'll take redfish and call it snapper, or they'll call Escalar um, white tuna, or they'll call, you know, so they just use different marketing names to try to get people to consume product, but it's, it's fraud. You're not Mm. telling somebody what they're actually eating. Mm. Um, and so, they're finding alarming rates. The New York Times came out with a really good, a really big study that was, it was fascinating to see how much fraud was actually going on in the United States. And it, it's, it's, I don't know the percentages, but it's alarming. There, how recent was that article? Do you remember? Last year. Okay. Yeah, and then they found, uh, you know, I who one of my actually customers was was actually involved in a major fraud case. Um, See the table. They're a Brooklyn-based company that was. Um, selling imported tuna and calling it local. And they, you know, it, it, it tragically hurt their business. Wow. Um, I, I was selling them fish, but they weren't being super transparent with it, where everything was coming from. Mm-hmm. Like I would tell them a boat and they would hold that boat for six months when maybe that boat was pulled out of the water and not fishing. And so, you know, for a lot of things, we have to sell the product. It's a perishable good. It's going bad. Time bomb starts, right? Like, you can't, certain fish dif- decompose differently, but you have a very limited amount of shelf life, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so whatever somebody can do to sell that product, like they will. And that's mm-hmm. what where we find fraud mm-hmm. is because like, well, can I sell this redfish? Well, you know, normal people don't know what redfish is, but they know what snapper is, right? They're going to eat snapper or they're going to eat grouper when it's really cod. Right. And so it's 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 really important to be transparent with what the product is, where it's coming from, and and to educate chefs. Cause these are the people that are setting their menus and are, are ultimately responsible. Which I, I think that we're getting better at, but it, you know, it's still it still can be alarming. You had a really interesting point the other night about the restaurant industry and wholesaling and how th- Obviously, they pay for a lot of um, certain things like alcohol on the day of delivery. Oh, you're going to get me started Right up front. Well, I found this so fascinating because it was something that I never really considered. But something like fish, you have invoices. Oh, yeah. It's, we're just, you know, it's hard to love what you do when you just, you don't get paid for what you do. So, you so know? talk about this from the beginning, so yeah, someone can so, understand what this. So, is. like in business, you have credit terms. Credit terms can be anywhere from seven days to cash on delivery to forty-five days. And in the restaurant industry, a lot, most people pay for their liquor up front, right? But liquor is an item that can be inventoried. It's an item that can be resold. It's an item that can be taken, right? Seafood is an item that historically has had long credit terms. 
right? And so meaning meaning that. 45 day you 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 go and you uh you buy a piece of fish, you don't have to pay for it for 45 days. Yeah, it's already been eaten by the It's time, already been eaten and you've already you collected it on your money. Right. You've swiped the credit card, you've collected the cash, you've made your money. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to see it for 30 to 45 days. You meaning the fishmonger. Yes. <laughs> but me the fishmonger pay for my goods in right. and, and 3 to 7 days. Right. Especially when it comes to local fishermen. So it's you know, it becomes a balancing act for me who like, you know, we can go into where I started. Like I started the business like from humble beginnings, sleeping in my truck, like working out of my parents' basement, um, you know, and 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 I, I only left the basement because the city was fining me because I kept a commercial vehicle in their par in their driveway. And so I like found some hood that was gentrifying at the time and got a retail store and was like, all right, I guess I'll sell a couple of restaurants. You know, and now we're in a hundred restaurants and we, you know, have seven trucks and a big warehouse and we've done something right. But now we've really become a restaurant finance company because restaurants typically, for the most part, when we have some really awesome partners that, that believe in what we're doing and they pay for their goods and they pay fast. And, you know, I have, you know, 50 restaurant partners that are amazing, you know, and then I have a bunch that aren't, but we do a good job of, uh, you know, figuring out who's who. But yeah, typically, you know, we have to bridge a gap of, you know, 30 to 45 days um, before we get paid. So it's, it, it becomes challenging. That just feels so backwards to me. Like if, if we're going to start supporting local, we need to be paying for the perishable goods and yeah. the vegetables and the fish um, but, right and away. Listen, I get it. It's hard to run a business. It's hard to run a food service business, mm -hmm. right? But um but that's a small way, you know, if I was a business owner and that's something I'd never considered. And if, if it was within my means to make that call of what items we were going to pay for those invoices right away, I think that this is really important for people and let's, here. You know, when, when we're picking out the best product, the guys that are paying for it the fastest typically get they're a little getting, bit better fish. The, the top, yeah, the top getting, crust, yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. It, uh... Yeah, you know, it just creates its own challenge in business. But, you know, we're, we're working through it with finding good partners and being aligned and creating a partnership. And like, yo, chef, it's 70, but it's blowing 40 miles an hour. And it's a danger for somebody to fish. Like, you're not getting your black sea bass. Like, you got to look outside and understand that, like, mm -hmm. you can't fish. Like, this is wild caught protein. Like, but there's plenty of stuff out of Florida that we can source for you. Or there's plenty of stuff out of North Carolina that we can source for you. But like, yo, if you're going to be a diva over the one product that like we can't physically harvest, like mm. you're not the right fit for us. Mm. And so, you know, we have those conversations, those open conversations. But, you know, chefs uh, sometimes get tunnel vision on what they put on a menu. Like I put black bass on a menu and I have to have it no matter what. And if I don't, it's going to ruin my week and mm. nobody's going to come to my restaurant. And like, yo, like it's going to be okay. We're going to source you, you know, a snapper for a week while the weather sorts itself out. So we really look for partnerships that can connect, um, that, that can really see, like, live by the ocean and understand the ocean. And, like, it's every day. It's fish. It's wild-caught protein. Mm. Like, it's, things are going to happen. Things are going to change. Product isn't going to be there. Product is going to be there. So it really just depends on, on what's happening. Yeah, for sure. What I love about you is it, it's, you really started and you still do, but with your hands in the water and getting down there and being on the boats and having all these, I was listening to you talk about how there's nothing like yeah, being I mean, on a boat. Yeah. And I'm not a fisherman. I don't claim to be. I don't play one on TV. I just, I enjoy fishing. I enjoy the food aspect of it. Um, I do really enjoy getting on a commercial boat and just putting in like a hard day's work, salt hitting me in the face, like waves up and down, doing physical labor, and then like pulling out, like looking down and seeing what's coming out of the water. It's like exciting. It's like mm. a thrill. You're like, oh, what's going to happen next? What's going to come next? Um, yeah. Tell me tell me about some of the more romantic aspects of, of what you've experienced and done. And maybe if there's like a particular peak moment um, from doing this work that you want to share that just like really resonates with you? Um, yeah, I, I, 
I love getting back to the blue collar aspect of the work. Cause I think that it, there's like a, there's an honor in it. There's an honor in blue collar work. It, it, you're, it's hard to find people that really respect that and that respect that trade. But I just, I think it's great. Um, and, and I took, a I took some press out on a commercial boat with a friend of mine and we were setting gill nets. Um, the way a gill net works is that you have a buoy on one end, a buoy on another, kind of an anchor-ish type of equipment on the bottom. And it's a net that kind of sits there, it floats and has mesh and fish swim through it and the targeted species get caught. Now, bycatch, meaning not the targeted species, happens. And it happens a lot. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, gill netting can be looked, can be frowned upon because it there's definitely bycatch that happens. Um seasoned fishermen will set nets in areas that limit bycatch. So I took a couple of photographers and some press out on a gill net fishing boat. And it was actually like just the perfect salty day, right? It was gray. It was kind of snotty out. Like it was windy. It was, you know, we're going up and down. For me, it was like, hell yeah, perfect. Right. And so we were having this good trip and uh, my buddy Jamie uh, on the Weibo is telling a story, he's the captain, he's telling a story about how he gets excited about every time he catches a product and it's just so awesome. And every time he sees the first fish come over, he gets excited and he wants to know what it is. And so we, so we start hauling our first gear and he looks in the water and he just goes, oh no. And uh, we caught a sturgeon, which is was, was outlawed in, in New Jersey and really on the East Coast because we were overfishing them because they were used for ca caviar. And then the meat was really good. So like typically, you know, if you're eating some fancy caviar, it's of the sturgeon variety, whether it's from Iran or, or uh, BC or, or whatever. And so uh, they're outlawed, but they happen. They're there. We haven't caught any commercially recreationally for so many years. That How big is this fish? So I'd say that it was probably about 20 pounds. So maybe like three feet long. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I look back and I tell... I tell the uh, press about bycatch and about, you know, these things happen and the fish are alive. They're really durable. So we cut it out of the net, you throw it back. Okay, no harm, no foul. That fish is going to go on to live a prosperous life. Well, we caught 24 of those and all of them were alive and we threw it all back. But in the process, we, uh, we uh, are, are looking down at the net and we see this like massive shadow in the water. And I just look at the captain's face and he just is like, oh no, what is that? And we both look at each other and we look down and we're 500 feet off of the beach. So we're like right up against the beach. And there's a giant bluefin tuna that had hit the net going so fast. It rotated the net three times. And typically like a whale, the way these things are, are, are built is that if a whale hits, it'll just, it'll just split open. So if a whale comes through, but we're not seeing like these species this close. And so- um, The net will split open. The net will split open. The whale will swim through all okay. as well. Okay. You know, um, now we catch a bluefin tuna, but it was out of season. Mm. So the fish had had died and uh, we weren't allowed to keep it, but we couldn't get it out. So we had to haul it onto the boat, but it's a 500 pound So you weren't animal. allowed to keep it. So the expectation would be what? You just throw it back. You just throw it back. Dead into the ocean. Dead and into the water. kind of waste yeah. the meat because that's the law, right? That's the law. Okay. And that, it was a beautiful fish too. Mm -hmm. It was, and, and, but fish swim in packs. So there was something wrong with the fish. The fish got lost. It was really close to shore. We're not used to seeing fish that close to shore. Those fish are 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 miles off the coast. So mm. to find one that was 500 feet, like there was some sort of issue there. Um, you know, he's been doing this for 25 years, has never seen this. I bring press on the boat one time. Obviously <laughs> we're catching bycatch. Um, and so, yeah, we had to like, I had to give them the sustainability talk while butchering a tuna on the boat of a, of a, uh, of a gillnet fishery. And uh, I definitely kept a little tuna line. Yeah, I was gonna. Sorry, Noah. I, I was gonna <laughs> say like, so you 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 did you harvest you you butchered it on the. Ship I, I yeah. I, <laughs> because I was like, I cut it into big giant chunks, and these, but these are. I was gonna say this is one of those karmic loins. moments that I'm talking and about. It's I like felt terrible, but right. I've also fed a bunch of sharks and. 
Right. I'm so giving you, it back to the ecosystem and I, you know, used it as hush money for the reporters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I remember you saying you also gave some out to the community, which I love that. Just like taking fish. That's the thing you do, right? Yeah. I, you know, typically like if I spear a fish and uh, I'm not going to eat 10, 15 pounds of, of striped bass. So like, I just believe in giving it back to uh, my community members. So like, you know, I went around town and I, handed out little baggies of, of product and, you know, didn't charge anything for it. And it's part of like giving it back to my community, mm-hmm. you know, but obviously didn't make any money there, which is fine. I don't, I, uh, I, I like, I like giving away what's caught because that's the sense of community. That's like what we would have done 300 years ago when we were hunter and gatherers, you know, we would have caught a product and we would have fed the people that were in our area. So mm-hmm. if I catch a fish personally, like that's what I do. Mm. Especially if I can't sell it. I'm thinking uh, about tuna again, and I'm thinking about the thing that you told me about the CO2. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, no. Tuna, especially in other countries, is adulterated just like a lot of other products are, and it's it's messed with. And so we Why? glamorize, right? We want our tuna to be bright red. Because that's a trend. Because, well, it's a trend, it and looks- for the most part, like, when it's red, it's full of blood, it's full of flavor. It's definitely more desirable. And so not all tuna that come out of the ocean are red. You know, in New Jersey and in, in the East Coast, we have a lot of pink, like bubblegum flavored tuna that just because it's that color doesn't mean that it's not beautiful. It's sushi grade, eat it, cook it raw, eat it raw, whatever. Um, but what they found that is tuna reacts really well to carbon dioxide. And so if you put the carbon dioxide into the meat, it will turn it bright red. So it's like it's like if you leave a piece of meat out on the, mm. out on, you know, exposed. So, so it oxidizes yeah. it. So it's essentially it's a similar process that goes on. Um, and so they stick little like little uh, probes into it and they juice it full of carbon dioxide. Uh, and and it uh, turns bright red. But if you do it too long, it turns like fluorescent pink. And if you don't do it enough, it's like it, it's it's a really tricky process. But a lot of times when you're getting a frozen saku block, which is what they call them, they're blocks of tuna, they're typically, uh, you know, gassed with something. Yeah, you were saying it's really, it looks really off-putting when you see a piece of tuna that's been gassed too much and, it just, and it's like neon. Yeah, it looks like a piece of like glowing toxic waste. So let's eat that, right? That's really going to be delicious. Mm. But, you know, it's... Appetizing. Yeah, it happens, you know. It, it, when we catch these fish, not everybody knows what to do with poor quality or undesirable products. Mm. That's what I'm really good at. Um, but for the most part, like, it'll go to waste. And so it's hard to... It's hard to like throw out something that's just been caught and that's beautiful just because it's like not bright red. Mm-hmm. So I'm so impressed with all this. And and I didn't really get to see this side of you until Sedona. But when we were in New Jersey, when we initially met, I did get to hear a little bit more about your personal journey. And I remember thinking about you, wow, this person has seriously been through some shit. And you have so many gifts. You you have all the fish stuff. You're this incredible writer and you do poetry and you do some comedy stuff too. And if you're if you're open to it, I would love for you to share about just the, the fabric of, of who you are and um, where you've come from a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. I'm very open with my struggles with addiction and, and battling um, substance abuse over the years. And frankly, like it came hand in hand with the restaurant industry. Like if you're in the restaurant industry, like you're going to be making a ton of money, buying a big bag of Coke and going out raging, sleeping till two o'clock and then rinse and repeat. And I just fell into that um, epidemic. I really would and for the service industry. And it just kind of got out of control. Um, you know, my... My drug of choice was definitely alcohol and cocaine and um, really anything else that I could get my hands on. I really love drugs. I'd never got into opiates, thankfully, but, uh, you know, really battled over the years with um, finding my acceptance in uh, without without alcohol. And so I just 
became uh, became an addict and and had to kind of figure it out all out on my own. You know, had uh, had had some some really really high highs and some really lows. You know, I attempted uh, I attempted a suicide after like a really bad week of bender on you know Coke and Xanax and kind of hit rock bottom and started to and started to kind of put the pieces back together and realize like just how beautiful life was, which is essentially like a new stage of self development for me that. Uh, has come full circle, which is how we ended up connecting because I've done a ton of work on just, you know, finding sobriety and really um, plant medicines have, has really helped me out seeing kind of uh, the impact that my ego made in substance abuse, right? And so- Can we talk more about that? You know, I think that fear of missing out, Mm. Right, like I don't want to miss this party. Like I want to get fucked up with my friends and create this amazing experience and live for these moments that I'll never ever remember. Mm. Right, instead of living for the moments that you're never gonna forget. Right, like I'm sick of. I I, I became really tired of having the cheap laugh that I wasn't gonna remember the next day and not the precious memory that I'll never forget. And mm. so, um, you know, I, I did it all myself and found that. Uh, I just needed to clean myself up. I didn't use any, you know, AA or anything like that. I have two alcoholic parents that I, I watched uh, go through AA and and just kind of got turned off by their experience with it. And it, so it was nothing on them. But uh, yeah, got got sober about two and a half years ago. What worked for you? Um, <laughs> I had a really rough night of tequila and cocaine. Yeah. That like I woke up on the floor of my apartment. Like I entered like T-Rex arms to the side, like figure out how to get home, made it home, passed out in front of like with my legs in the door. You, you were just feeling just, so horrible. Oh, I was feeling great at that oh, moment. <laughs> yeah. I'm picturing just, T-Rex arms. T-Rex arms is just like my go-to blackout. Like, <laughs> oh, like, you know, he's drunk when he has T-Rex arms. <laughs> and, uh. And so like, and it, they're really good at navigating, you know, you could like, whenever your T-Rex are out, it just like navigates to your, your bed or someplace to sleep. Cause it's like the clock ticks. And I just woke up and I felt like shit for a week. Mm. And I was like, what, what the fuck am I doing? Was that, would you say like your rock bottom moment or was uh, there another? I mean, there was a few, you know, and that was after kind of, I, I woke up on a balcony in the middle of the winter with a rope on my neck. I was like, what the fuck was what? I trying to do? Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I, I got, I got blacked out and decided I didn't want to live anymore and decided to take my last pill of Xanax, put the rope on it, tied it off, passed out before I did it. And so- and You were going to hang yourself I off was, the balcony. I was, yeah. And so luck, thankfully, um, substance abuse saved my life as well because I got too fucked up. I fell asleep because I was on a bunch of Xanax and, uh, I woke up the next morning and and that was that was probably my rock bottom moment for sure. Um but it uh from there I uh I kind of called for help, you know, with my parents and some friends and told some people and was like, "Yo, I'm I'm in a bad spot." Yeah, what was that like? Like, okay, so I'm picturing you waking up, you take the rope off your neck, you have yeah. this like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, moment. that was And yeah. then and then Walk me through, walk me through that moment. I, I, I knew I had to leave immediately. Like I couldn't, I was living in uh, Baltimore, Maryland and my uh, neighbor was a cocaine dealer and mm. it was really easy and she was really cool. And it just like, it was like, haha, let's party. And I just felt like a failure. I, I had left a job and a relationship wasn't working out and I got hosed on uh, just a lot of areas of my life and just didn't, ha had no will, right? And like, I naturally have had stages of anxiety and depression before and, you know, chasing depression with depressants and, and, and substances doesn't really work. And it just hit, it hit the perfect timing of, uh, of a really dark depression around, you know, not being that successful entrepreneur from my last business you know, and kind of taking it on the chin there. And uh, I was failing at a new job. I wasn't happy. And I just, you know, failing at a relationship that I thought was going to be like the one and f just failing. And, and uh, yeah, to, to tried to take uh, that road. And thankfully I didn't. Thankfully from there, I found the beauty of life. And, 
you know, I cleaned myself up then for, you know, two or three years, was sober and then kind of fell off the wagon a little bit and what well, didn't really get out of control, but was like, yeah, this doesn't work for me anymore. And now I've come full circle and, and uh, mm. really, really, really appreciate those memories mm. because it allowed me to kind of be where I am and find creative outlooks like my poetry or my comedy or my, um, you know, drawing or whatever it is that I use for creative um, outlets. You know, coming out of substance abuse is hard, but with discipline and, and with the right outlets and with the right, um, you know, crew behind you, you can, you can do it. You know, especially the people that like were close to me were like high five, right? The people that I was partying with were like, what's wrong with you, man? Let's go get some beers, you know? And like, I just never had control. Two would be 20 and 20 would be Coke. And then I'd wake up in Vegas married or something kind of crazy happened. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I, I grew up figuring it out for myself, you know, with parents that didn't really, that worked and weren't really around all the time. And I was a street kid and city kid. So I would go in and, you know, buy an ounce of weed in New York and sell it to the Jersey kids. And, mm. oh, you want ecstasy? Yeah, I know where to get that and sell that. And then, you know, I went to University of Colorado as like a street smart city kid and was like, uh oh, I could do a lot of dangerous things here. And I did. And I, uh, you know, lost a lot of friends in the process. I think I lost six friends to just substance abuse and a um, couple ODs. We had a pool incident where my good friend uh, passed jumping out of his third story balcony into a pool and missed. And so that was a tough one. And, and you so, were there for that? Mm, yeah. I, I, I actually, I kicked him out. I was, a, I was a bouncer at a bar and I kicked him out of the bar because he was acting like an asshole. And then I went to his house afterwards and he was just... <laughs> That was the house where we would like put ski goggles on, do a bunch of blow in the middle of the summer and like dance to the talking heads till 4 a.m. And uh, it was one of those nights that just got a little out of control. And uh, yeah, Justin, he uh, he tried to hit the pool and missed and 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 uh, died. So that was, you know, and then you know, some ODs and some, you know, Coke and Xanax is not a good thing for your body. They're very opposite and they'll just, your heart will stop. And- I've lost a bunch of friends to that. And I think, you know, I was trying to go that road too with my, with my partying. I just didn't care. And so I was doing both. Um, but, you know, made you it. You didn't care? I didn't, no. I didn't. I just, I wanted to numb the feeling of, of everything, which is, which is what I did. Um, but uh, it, got, it got me to a really, eventually it got me to a really positive place. And I don't mind talking about those stories because I think there's a lot of people out there that like, listen, like we're not going to college anymore to study history for the most part. We're going to college to get fucked up and have an experience, mm. right? Like the American dream is to like go get fucked up, graduate, and then like, oh, figure out what I want to do with my life. Like I, I'm, I, I was there. I did it. I fucking partied like a rock star for <laughs> probably six years and then had no idea what I wanted to do with a business degree and. Uh, I knew I didn't want to wear a suit and like seafood found me, thankfully. Um, but we're also, I'm also in an industry of total fucking degenerates, mm. which uh, led itself to kind of my career choice was like, oh, I can like do this while I'm drunk. Mm. Actually, <laughs> the fir- my first day in, uh, on the Boston Fish Pier, I, uh, I had, before I moved to Boston, I went out and I got just rip roaring drunk i probably drank like 30 guinnesses and 10 shots of jameson just like i'm never gonna be back in new york i'm moving to boston and i got into a i got into like a gnarly fist fight coming out of the path train and i got my ass kicked i was so drunk uh the guy the guy broke my nose knocked out two of my teeth the day before i moved and so (laughs) I, i was i was in the dentist chair the next morning Hung over. Hung over, <laughs> smelled like a brewery. I had a broken nose and I moved to Boston the next morning. So my first day of work in the Boston Fish Pier, I had two big black eyes, a broken nose, mm. and a fresh, uh, fresh new grill. <laughs> fresh um, so, new grill. Yeah, fresh new grill. And, uh, That's where you got the nickname Fish Grills. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Just and uh, and my, my buddy who I started, you know, was working with and, and for, he, uh, he's like, yeah, dude, whatever. It's seafood. No one cares. And so I introduced everybody with 
two black no eyes and no teeth. And, and uh, that's how my career in Boston started. <laughs> yeah, that was a oh, rough day. Man. Wow, that's, that's a fascinating story. Um, and for the most part, my time in Boston, I was just a raging out dog. Wow. But it was, it was. I, I mean, I'm curious about this because you talk about that moment or that embodiment of the not caring, right? And I personally have had moments of that in my own experiences with depression. And what I'm curious about collecting more information about is how do we get how do we get to those states? How do we forget so hard that we end up literally not caring whether we live or die? Well, it's like societal pressures to succeed, yeah. right? Like we've developed this, like you have to have 2.5 kids and a minivan and a college plan and a house. And, and when you, when like your life doesn't end up being that way, like we get all depressed and, and like, oh, like I'm not married. I'm not on this path. And, and I think that that has a lot to do with it. I think that, you know, we need to be more open-minded with people and be more accepting to, mm. you know, not following the path that we have set up for you to succeed. Not, you know, like be, you don't have to believe in that God or this God or mm. your God or their God. Like just follow what your heart tells you and, and it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. But for me, like it really mattered. Right. I really cared. I was not a success. Mm -hmm. I, I was doing well. You, are you one of those people who, you know, like you care what other people, I mean, none of us like to admit I, yeah. it. I think we all yeah, care yeah, what yeah. other people think to some degree, but was that a big theme in your life at that point? Uh, How you I, presented? I've, I've never really cared that much what other people think. I'm kind of like, here's my cards. This is who I am. If you don't like me, fuck you. Talk to you never. Mm -hmm. Um, but I cared what my family and my close immediate friends thought. Mm -hmm. um, and I compared, you know, I had the compare right. Right. Uh, compare issue. And, and, you know, with my abuse and my struggles with substance abuse, I was really behind my peer group, mm. you know? And so I felt like such a failure because my friends were out making money and getting jobs and doing really well and buying houses and having kids. And that compounded kids. the issue, I'm and then sure. And I was like, oh, I'm so pathetic. Mm. Look at me. Mm. Like, no one loves me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so this, that's interesting, this societal pressure. I think for me, what I'm hearing is that, and what I've had in my own experience is really this theme of attachment. Like mm. we are the ones, meaning you and I, or, or anybody who's experiencing this pressure, we are the experiencer of it. Like, yes, I mean, society plays a role in creating it, but the way that we're internalizing it is really what, I think creates that victim mentality that for me was like this rot that got into my core and just started creating those negative thought patterns that led me down that road. Mm. So just being attached to, like you said, yeah, the societal pressures are there, but I'm the one attaching to their worth. Oh, for sure. Yeah. For mm. sure. I, um, you know, I, I always thought that my life was going to go one way. And it, when it went the total opposite, I got super depressed. Mm. And um, I, I didn't, I didn't understand that like, it's okay to just be you and to, because it wasn't what you're taught. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially coming from like, you know, I'm older than you and my, my parents are, you know, baby boomers that went through, you know, the hippie generation and they worked super hard to, you know, buy are you that. Older than me? Yeah. Oh, I'm 38. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so like they worked super hard to uh, provide this life. And when you weren't living up to that life, they were just so upset with you. Mm. Right. And it was like, mm. you have to do good in school. You have to do this. And, mm. and those are the pressures. But I think that, that those are easing a bit. Yeah. Well, also just industries, like I'm, I'm watching the jobs that are being created every day now. And I see that our youth is a little bit destabilized. You know, we still have this old model of going to college and this is the way that things are and people come out and they're not getting jobs right away, especially because the jobs that are there are being created like tomorrow. You know what I mean? It's just like, we don't even know what we need yet 
to be right, training but, people on it. But just it, because so. you went to college doesn't mean you're entitled enough to get a great job. No, absolutely. Like, That's what I'm saying. Put the fucking work in. It's um, like, you know, you're seeing it in, in the restaurant industry particularly. Mm. You know, everybody wants to be chefs, but they don't want to spend 20 years on their feet grinding, mm. working, you know, 100 hour weeks to be the chef that's on TV. Right. And well, and I think there's this sense of urgency. I mean, certainly there's this entitlement that feels a little bit ubiquitous with, For sure. I think also that's always been said. Previous mm. generations have always said about the upcoming generation, they're very entitled, granted. But I think that things are, are moving very, very fast now. And so our youth is coming up with this sense of like, we don't have time. We don't have time to put in 20 years for this, this, but and that. That's our, but that's our culture for everything. For sure. We don't have time for anything. No, and I agree. I agree. Um, our, our phones do it all. Like, dude, what a great time to be alive. <laughs> like, everything is done for us. The Google machine. Oh, my. The Google machine works so well. I think about that sometimes where I'm sitting with a group of people, and it's like, oh, yeah. Someone says a movie quote, and everyone's like, yeah, what was that from? And then someone just whips out and Googles it. And I'm like, you know what? Sometimes I kind of wish we had the magic of not knowing a little yeah. bit more. Or, like using the Dewey Decimal System to figure out yeah, an answer by looking at a book. Yeah, there are apps for everything. You can yeah. like take a picture of a bird and it'll be like, this is the type of bird you're looking at. It's just like, I don't know. I remember when the commercials first started coming out for the first apps, like for the first probably iPod. This was maybe even before iPhone when you could, they were just starting to get apps, the iPod touch. Yeah. Well, and they used to have these things that were like paper and they would have locations and you'd have to like follow roads. And they were called <laughs> yeah, maps. Yeah, no, I remember right? You had to have like too. a sense of direction. But I remember watching the iPod, I, yeah, iPod commercials and there was these famous commercials of the app that was like the keyboard. And it was like, wait, there's a keyboard you can play yeah, on yeah, your yeah. phone and it makes music like a real piano. And now that just is like so elementary. But what you're going to see in the next decade or two are some of these like quote unquote blue collar jobs are going to be those high paying jobs. Mm. Those entrepreneurial careers in plumbing and electric and mm. things that people don't want to do because they're, you know, above or they work too hard or they wanted this big tech job. Like those entrepreneurs, because they're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of these uh, blue collar industries and some of, uh, uh, you know, plumbing, electric, heating, like these guys are making really good money because nobody wants to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you mentioned earlier the mapping of the fish and, and technology and, and being able to see where the fish are. How else has technology affected your industry? for the better or for the worse? So for the worst, I'd say that we created technology that could essentially wipe out populations really easily. So like, oh, this is this fish, it's right here. Let's set this gear here and mm -hmm. let's harvest them all, mm -hmm. right? So we had to kind of reverse that trend um, and, and set up different areas and make it a little bit more difficult because technology is easy. A lot of the, you know, Chinese are, 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 are out there really harvesting whatever they can get a hold of. Mm -hmm. And with technology, it makes it really easy to wipe out large populations of fish. Mm -hmm. So that's a negative um, aspect. You know, this morning I had a meeting and I was showing people um, an app called Marine Traffic. I can see when a boat like the Captain Caden goes out of Point Pleasant or if a boat goes out of Montauk, I can see that boat is out on the water fishing. So now I know that he's out and he's out for 26 hours. So now I can pre-sell what I know is going to be coming off his boat. So now I can get that product to a chef or the end user as fast as possible. So I always say like this business model isn't very tough. I'm not a very smart dude, but I know that if you get product to a perishable product to the end user as fast as possible, it's going to be pretty good and people are going to like it and mm. they're going to want more. And so really that's just what we do is that we use, you know, technology through those apps and, you know, um, some of our uh, like tracking systems for where our trucks are and making sure that we're really optimizing how we're doing our logistics, um, whether it's through like Verizon Connect and they have some really awesome software and, uh, you know, getting getting the product to the end user as fast as possible. So, you know, that's really help, helped our business, but also like taking a step back and going back to artisanally caught items, like the example with the bluefin tuna. 
Like if you were to tell me when they were impersonating fish that like the, the next, like the fish are going to go to a, or the fishermen are going to start using harpoons to catch. I'd be like, yeah, right. Like, what is this, 1910? Like we're not harpooning <laughs> fish anymore, but we are. What's, and, yeah, I was going to ask you, what's the deal with canned tuna? I mean, obviously personally, I don't eat, try not to eat things out of a can or things that are overly processed, but mm. I know back when I was doing like figure modeling, bodybuilding kind of things, it was like you eat tilapia and then you eat canned tuna. And yeah, well, high protein source. Now there's this whole thing and like, you know, some of the tunas say line caught, sustainable. Like, mm. can you speak to people who are eating tuna out of a can and like, what are you, what are you feeling about that? I have a, I have a sense, but. It's a really interesting fishery. You should Google it sometime and watch it. They have like these, these lines on a stick and they just like, dip the line in and then they like haul a tuna as hard as they can over their shoulder and it goes into a like a box and then they do it again. <laughs> and they're just like constantly going back and forth, like lifting these 50 pound tunas. It's like hay Typ- bailing, but for tuna. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Typ- typically for on the West Coast, uh, you know, as long as we're not catching, we're not out there harvesting a, a massive population. We're not killing dolphins. We're not killing whales in the process. Like, and they're line caught, not persaned. Mm-hmm. And, and not caught using um, things that can wipe out populations. And like, I, I personally don't really have a problem with it. I like rod and reel caught tuna, um, you know, to East Coast. I make a really dope tuna salad mm. um, with, uh, you know, locally sourced yellowfin. But they also use skipjack, they use albacore, they use, you know, but think about how big of an industry the tuna, canned tuna industry right. is. So like, how long can we keep up with that stock? Right. Right. Like we, like we can preserve other products like that. Right. It might not be tuna, but it, you know, the next item is coming. We just really haven't accepted it yet. Mm. And if that item is beeliner snappers or rose fish out of South Carolina or dogfish out of New England or New Jersey or monk tails, like we're going to have to figure that out. Really, it sounds like we just need to be more open-minded about what we're eating and um, eat, again, what's local and what's in season. It, like we have That's to eat the bottom with line. our ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if you're in the Midwest, like eat the Asian carp that's affecting all of your waters. Like mm-hmm. it's a good fish. Mm-hmm. Like it's there because it's a problem. Mm-hmm. Like if you're in Idaho, like eat steelhead. Yeah. You know, if you're in... Uh, you, you, you know, some of these landlocked areas, like look for items that are, you know, sustainably sourced. Mm-hmm. Look for items that are, um, you know, green listed on the Monterey Bay. Although I don't totally agree with their processes, but, you know, they do a good job of bringing awareness to fisheries. Can you talk about mercury? Yeah. Because um, it's a big, it's a big kind of trending. Well, it's always been, but, you know. My mom was always like, don't eat too much salmon because of the mercury content. Like eat, you can eat some, like maybe one piece a week. But can you talk about that for people who may not know about that and what are the myths surrounding it? I mean, so if, if you're a fish and you're swimming in polluted waters, you're going you're gonna to breathe in some shit. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're, you know, living by a, a, a waste dump, you're going to breathe in some shit. Um, and so fish are the same way. If you're swimming in polluted waters and you're a larger fish, you've been doing it a lot longer, hmm. right? So typically the larger animals are higher in mercury content and certain um, fish uh, are higher in mercury than others. You know, certain fish that have higher with, migratory with patterns. So like tuna, swordfish, mm-hmm. those are high. Uh, striped bass, you know, they're, they're kind of inshore. So they're picking up a lot of things inshore, PCBs and a lot of, Negative. Do you um, limit your intake of those? Personally? I try to. Like, I don't eat swordfish. Mm-hmm. I, I like tuna. I'll deal with the mercury poisoning if I have to. Mm-hmm. Um, but typically, you know, if you're eating a, a New England or Northern Canadian or even kind of Canyon caught tuna, like, I'm not typically worried too too much about it. You had a story about. I feel like it was Fukushima or or something. I, well, no, I, I don't know. I have no science and no evidence of this, mm. but in the last two years, I have noticed a major effect on the tuna population and diseases within the tuna. Mm-hmm. And so diseases happen in fish just like they happen in humans. So you'll get mahi-mahi that are gelatinous, that can't be eaten. Ugh. You'll get swordfish that have like 
major, major parasites. I don't eat swordfish because I've seen like tumors and parasites in them and I just, it's really gross. So you're seeing like they're coming off the boats and you're looking, you're examining it to see the quality and you're seeing parasites and tumors. All over. And, and more, more, more than ever. The last two years I've been seeing pus pockets and parasites in tuna that really weren't there. Now, is it related? I have no idea. Let's hear your conspiracy theory. Yeah, I, listen, I don't know. I'm not sure. But like these are cancer-esque issues. And these fish are migrating. And these fish are migrating through areas that could essentially have tidal flow that were from Fukushima. Uh, and so wow, it could be so trace crazy. amounts, but you know, I, I know they've done some testing and you know, the areas are safe, but I'm, um, you know, I'm just talking about what I'm seeing. Bearing on the side. Yeah. Of and so I, I typically don't source West coast tuna hmm. because of that, hmm. but there's also amazing fisheries in New Zealand that are harvesting beautiful fish. And I don't know that they can say the same thing. Hmm. You know, I don't, I'm very like domestic mm -hmm. when it comes to my fishery. I focus really on fisheries in the United States and I, I like food and I like fish. And when I travel, I eat at other places and I, I, I like to experience them. But like for my knowledge base, like I, I got enough for the U.S., maybe a couple more because like our oceans are so abundant with different species that um, it's hard to keep track of all of them and how each one is being fished. Mm -hmm. So that's part of my daily process. Learning. Yeah. So um, as we wrap up here, as I've still got you on the mic, is there anything right now that you're learning about or you're getting excited about or you're maybe getting angry about, but like a particular topic that you feel like the world needs to know right now and that people just don't know about it. If you'd like to rap for a few minutes about any of those things, um, we'd love to hear that. I mean, I think the world needs to get back to eating from the ecosystem. I think it's really important. I think that they need to stop depending on foreign imports mm -hmm. for our protein sources. like And for our produce. And yeah, for and everything. for our flowers and our produce. Mm -hmm. And like the way that, like we can feed the masses with our protein alone. And if we were doing, if we were like, remember in the 80s when we were like buying Japanese cars and then we were like, went on this big like buy American campaign and we mm. have to support Detroit and all these, like we can do that for automobiles. Right. Right. But we can't right. do it for, for seafood. Like it, it, it's it's like alarming to me. It wow. seems like, yeah. why aren't Good we supporting point. these these people? And frankly, like, I don't know where the next generation of fishermen is going to come from. Why, why do you think people are like, oh, buy American fish? That doesn't sound. Yeah, because the 80s and 90s, the trend was like, we source everything from all over the world and we have the mm. best products from around the world. Wow. And now we're seeing that Exotic. like some of those items are drying up wow. and we're used to eating Chilean sea bass. We're used to eating tilapia. You know, we're used to eating all, all of these items. And like, again, I don't know, I don't know where the next source of fishermen is coming from because we, we're, it's not a glamour, it's not a glamour industry. It's not a glamour profession, right? It's, it's a different breed of human that wants to go out, risk his life every single day to harvest a protein source that people aren't respecting. Right? Like, how do you get behind that? Well, we just need you to like pop out like eight <laughs> little Morrises and teach yeah, them all yeah, the no, ways. I'm good there. <laughs> <laughs> You're like nowhere near there. Yeah, no, not, not uh, yet. Um, you know, we, but we need to get you, we need to get you having like your own little uh, school this, for people who are you know, interested yeah. in sustainable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a and, thought, but it's also like a protected, like fishermen don't want to tell you where they're fishing. Hmm. They don't want to give you the tricks of their trade because then they'll never be able to fish. So you have mm -hmm. like really weird, like coveted areas that like- Interesting. Like, oh, I get my lobsters from this area and this is my area. Like, Territorial. Get off my turf. Right. It was fun. It's crazy like that in the US, but when I noticed in Canada, they were very, um, they work together. Mm. There was more community based. It's Canadians, man. Canadians. I know all about it. <laughs> I, they were awesome. I was like, this is the way they should be doing Thanks. it. Thanks. We're great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, I was up on a charter doing some bluefin tuna fishing mm -hmm. and we, um, you're only allowed to catch one tuna. And so we ended up hooking up to two tunas and the captain takes this reel and it's like screaming. It's like, zzz, like the fish is fighting, right? And he straps it off and he 
connects this like big blue or big orange buoy to it and he throws it overboard. And you're like, what the fuck did this guy just do? Yeah. Like, he's got Why? a fish on. And his brother no. <laughs> comes like steaming out of nowhere, like, like gaffs up this line, like grabs the line, like sticks it in the gunnel, starts reeling it in. It was like, holy shit, did that just happen? So he so, gave the fish mm-hmm. to his brother's boat? Yeah, who was on another charter. Just rolled right up. Rolled right that up. That is so gaffed cool. It. Yeah, and <laughs> it was like, wow. Yeah, these guys work together and they play oh, nice. Man. And granted, they're brothers, but they were out there doing their thing. It was super yeah. cool to see. Oh, I love and that. I, I don't, listen, there's a lot of camaraderie in what we're doing now, but there's also a lot of like protection and, mm. and kind of keeping with the trade secrets. Mm. But on that note, like, you know, I think that the next generation, we need to start supporting them and coming up with a program that um, gives back to the younger generation mm-hmm. um, of fishermen and supports them. You know, mm-hmm. and if we can start doing that, we can create not only like a lot of jobs, but a lot of integrity around like our, our food source, mm-hmm. right? Like keep, keep if, if we can have a population of young 20 year old to 35 year old men and women that want a commercial fish will have a fishery for generations, mm-hmm. I hope. Because just like a lot of, you know, people are going back into farming and moving to outskirts of cities to get into farming and to get into living that sort of life, we can do that with fishing. And we just haven't seen that trend yet. But I think it's coming. I think it's I think it's definitely coming. And I'm excited about it. Amazing. So um, just, just to wrap up, if you had to summarize kind of two to three things for the average person coming away from this podcast, like, hey, these are the two to three things I want you to take away from this conversation. Mm here's the two to three things to do. And here's the two to three things to stop doing. I would love for that to be the way that Yo, we Yo, if you're out. in the Midwest, don't eat scallops. Okay. <laughs> They're going to be adulterated. Only, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously watch um, where your product is coming from. Try to eat locally. Try to eat seasonally. You can follow us on Instagram at local 130 seafood. Um, we, we do a pretty good job of, of highlighting what's coming out of different waters at different times of the year. Um, and, and, you know, look at things like the Monterey Bay and, you know, be open-minded with it and, and start thinking about where your actual seafood is coming from. Mm. Not just like, oh, it's fish. Well, fish have stories. And mm. so try to follow that story and try to like eat with that story and respect that story and um, be privileged to kind of be eating something that was really well taken care of. That was, that, that was hard work to get that piece of fish to your plate. And so follow it. Eric, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. People can find you personally at Eat Local Fish on that's, Instagram, that's right? That's it. Eat Local Fish, Local 130 Seafood, Local130Seafood.com. Um, and if people have questions about sourcing local fish, yeah, I mean, if people want to buy fish, can people in can people buy from you or support your business yeah, in some so way? Yeah, so we have uh, farmer's markets set up all over the state of New Jersey and in Philadelphia. Um, we'll be launching an e-commerce platform form for the holiday season. You know, holiday season is really big in seafood, and so we'll be ready for that then. And then, um, uh, you know, we sell to small markets around the country. So we can kind of direct you in, in a place, depending on where you're from, that— Listen, you know, if you're in rural Iowa, I got nothing for you but FedEx. <laughs> but like if you're in Chicago, I got a bunch of really awesome options. Or if you're in, you know, Denver or, or Phoenix or awesome. wherever it is. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the pod. Thanks for today. having me. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and meeting you and and going through this journey together. I'm excited for your journey. Thank you your so much. Your journey is gonna be rad. And it's great <laughs> oh, to gosh. it's great to hear. And I'm 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 psyched to follow along and just strap in and, and, and watch your ride. It's going to be cool. So thank you so much. Now I'm going to go crush that, uh, that <laughs> homemade sushi that you just made oh, for me. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much for listening today and thank you for choosing to spend your time here with me. Part of the shift I'm going through personally is one of trying to pay more attention, looking at how I'm showing up in the world. How am I breathing? How am I sleeping? How am I swiping? What am I eating? What am I supporting? Asking ourselves these questions is the first step and doing something actionable is the second. If you want to support Eric's business and simultaneously support this show because you value the work that is being done here, please consider visiting local130seafood.com and you can order some of Eric's amazing fish using the code THOUGHTROOM at checkout for $15 off. You can also support this show by tapping five stars on Apple and leaving just a line or two of your thoughts. This helps us establish the show and land highly sought after guests. It's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that these small gestures don't get noticed or that we don't need to do something about what we care about because someone else is probably doing it. This is the time to challenge all that. This is the time to move into creating the world that we believe in, the world that we think can exist through actively applying our action and our dollars. So if you like something, instead of just thinking it, really show support of it. If you want to change something, be active in that change.